How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be going over the intro and beginning part of chapter 1 of this fine module. Of course there is going to be a ton of spoilers so please don't watch this, but DMs don't want that added insight, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover. So here it is, chapter 1, the Witchlight Carnival. There is a bit of an intro. And what I'm going to tell you all about the intro is, one, check out my video on the five best ways to start off this adventure because there's a lot of great hooks in there. But realistically, the intro is the hook. How do you get your players to this witch-like carnival? There is, of course, the ones provided by the book. There's the ones provided by me. But the thing is, is you have to be very upfront with your players that, hey, you're going to this carnival. Their adventure is here and it's through this carnival that you're going to go off on a merry adventure. You need to be very forthcoming with that because they may try and build characters that try and subvert that expectation or try to go around it. Or maybe they think that the adventure is going to come to them. Whatever the case may be, you need to get your players to this carnival and they need to know that they are going to be in for a fun time. And you're going to force them to have a fun time. Now it is once you get your players to this carnival is when the fun times are bound. As they make the way here, they go right through to presumably the ticket booth to go and buy their tickets. But you may have some nefarious players that try and sneak in, in which case, hey, that's going to be part of the fun. But if they are poor, which I do recommend that you do have some people that are poor, whether that be the entire party or maybe just a few individuals can't afford their own tickets because there is a fun little aspect to showing up to the Witchlight Carnival without having enough money. Now, first off, use all the props that you can, whether that be art handouts or physical copies of things, whatever the case may be, get them these things because that's going to make it feel more real. For example, being this Witchlight Carnival ticket, and this can be just an admittance ticket, but there you can also find a fun one where you can have some punch outs and they use all eight of the punch outs and that's going to be a fun time. But the reason why I mentioned there should be some poor people is because, one, if they choose to sneak inside, then they have this fun little mini game of trying to run away from some of the Witchlight hands. But also importantly is if there is anybody that sneaks in here, then you can steal something from them and that's going to play a awesome pivotal role in the adventure later on. And then also, if you have people that are poor but are honest, then they can go up and say, please sir, I don't have any tickets. And then you can have them barter for a ticket. This is a great way to introduce the concept of keeping with your promises in this adventure. You can't just simply say one thing and then do something else. You have to stick to the law. And this could be in the form of these ticket packs here where you must not lie knowingly, you can't talk about your favorite subject, you, you talk about a unicorn, you do all these things and that's a great time. Now of course in the book here it states that when your players show up they have tickets for them and that's free. But what I would recommend is you only give them a few tickets and specifically each of these tickets only count for a few punches, maybe for only three attractions to kind of get them hooked in. And then once they've traveled around a bit and used those three tickets, then they go back and buy their useful one. And then you can also have that fun thing of, oh, hey, who helped us out getting those tickets in the first place? And that could potentially play a part as your players explore around. Now, it's right here in the very beginning. As we look at this ticket booth, right here we get an instance of what this whole adventure is all about. It's about these amazing NPCs that your players get to interact with. The first one being Nicholas, this old goblin who can't see or hear. And you can have a great time with him saying, what was that? I can't hear you. You know, just these characters are brought to life with just a few sentences. And it really goes a long way to really cementing what this adventure is all about. It's about those interpersonal connections with everybody. And it's going to be just absolutely amazing as your players interact with more and more of these people. And all of these regularly no-named NPCs have names and have fun interactions. Now, once your players finally show up to this carnival, that is when you should start tracking time. The book suggests that you roll out a D8 and you just have it be one, and then once an hour has passed, you roll to two. And that's actually a really good way to track time. But the thing is, is then you get into the minutia of, okay, how long does it take to go from here to there? And how long does each ride take? If you want to be super duper simple about it, you could just always say that it always takes 10 minutes to go from one location to the next and each ride attraction or whatever it is that you do always takes 10 minutes. In which case, over the course of 8 hours, you can have 80 of these travel or interactions, which is quite a lot actually. 
But if you don't want to go into that minutia of things, then you can just simply let the time roll by and just hand wave it all. Whatever is most comfortable for you and your group. Now, the real important aspect of this adventure is the tracking of the mood. As we can see here in the bottom right corner, there is a whole bunch of faces. And right as your players show up, it should be in the neutral meter. Now, as your players do things during this carnival, that is when the mood ticker is going to go up to being happy. Or if they do some nefarious things, then it's going to go down to being sad. Now, to really show off the effects of the Feywild and all of the emotions that it brings, make sure that as it gets happier, this place seems livelier. You know, people are more ecstatic, people are happy, people are louder, the place is just looks more vibrant. And if the place gets sadder, then you can have people be a lot more muted. And you can definitely have it, as it gets later on, where the color seems to be saturated out. Now, the reason why we have this is, one, to showcase how awesome the Fey interactions are. But two, once your players reach one end of the track in one way or another, that is when they're going to be approached by Mr. Witch and Mr. Light. And this is a big deal, of course, because Mr. Witch and Mr. Light are going to be the ones to show your players into Prismere. So your players need to get on their side, hopefully on their good side, but as we'll be seeing later on, there is a way you can get on their bad side, I guess. You can basically extort them into getting what you need to go to Prismere. And it's also here where we see the relationship between Mr. Witch and Mr. Light and the Hourglass Coven, where they are allowed to operate and anybody that shows up here without a ticket is allowed to have their things stolen. And that is, of course, a great time if anybody shows up to this place and they have some stuff stolen because that means one of the hags has one of their items and it'll be a great time. Charging on through, we get some more information about the carnival, specifically in the Witchlight Hands, about how they are people from all walks of life. And there's actually a lot of them. There's 124 of these employees meandering about the place, doing various jobs and whatnot. And what they have on them, they actually all have a bit of pixie dust so they can all fly around. And most important of all is they do have their own stat block. But the thing is, is hopefully this place doesn't come down to combat. It might come down to combat, but it really comes down to the type of individuals that you have. And it's also very interesting. All witch light hands apparently have the dancing lights message and prestidigitation cantrips. But if you have someone that has the background of witch light hand, then unfortunately they don't get these cantrips. I would suggest that if you have anybody with this background and they don't have these cantrips, you explain it away by saying that they were just about to learn it right before that this adventure was going to take place. And maybe that could be a reward later on after they go through the entire affair. They come back out and maybe they get three free cantrips. I guess that'd be cool. It is in this carnival overview where we get a lot of the fine details about how this place works. And the way this place works is Mr. Witch and Mr. Light just appear in some random field. And then boom, they lay out the entirety of this place and it magically comes to life. It is pretty awesome. Thanks to the power of the witch light hand, this place just works. <laughs> it works extremely well. Now, of course, you would think that everyone shows up to a public place and there is just the normal rules of hospitality of, hey, don't do anything bad. But unfortunately, we know that a lot of players are going to do a whole bunch of crazy shenanigans because there isn't any rules posted up. And that is the nature of it. There is no rules posted up. If any of your players do anything nefarious, such as assault, they are definitely getting kicked out. And if they do anything like thieving, then they are going to be tried to be shown out. And also importantly is the fact that if they do any of these things, then the Witchlight Tracker is going to go down in the unhappy side. We get a nice little D8 table on ways we can make this place come to life. But I'm going to write up some more occurrences and I'm going to be posting those all up in the Discord. So be sure to check out all that because we want to make this carnival come to life. So having a whole bunch of things, more than just eight little features here, is definitely going to be the way to go. And on to Wandering Outsiders, here is where we're introduced to Kettle Steam, who is a Kenku who is actually trying to find out the issue with Zybilna. And the way she's going about it is trying to cause a bit of mayhem, because she knows that if she causes enough mayhem, then Mr. Witch and Mr. Light are going to have to approach her. So she's doing a whole bunch of nefarious things, and your players can interact with her throughout the entirety of the carnival. 
And this is a great way to showcase off yet again how there is one, a whole bunch of different NPCs in this adventure, but two, your players can lean in to whatever it is that they want to do. Do they want to go the good approach where they do everything all nice and awesome? Or do they want to go down the route of causing a whole bunch of mischief and having a whole bunch of fun there? But for outsiders of the carnival here, we have the Thieves of the Coven. These are three agents, each working for their own respective hag in the Hourglass Coven. And these people are pretty creepy. We've got one of the Lornlings, which is a basically a t tiny version of Bavlorna Blightstraw here. We have So Pig, who is a ghoul that is wearing a pig mask and looks like a kid. Pretty creepy stuff here. And then we also have this terrible shadow. Now, shadows are normally ridiculous because they can outright kill lower level PCs because they drain strength. But it, it says here in the addendum that if someone is reduced down to zero strength, then they're simply knocked out and they get their strength back once they complete a rest. In addition to whatever stat block they have, they have the no ticket special ability and the sticky finger special ability. These are going to be used against the PCs should they show up without tickets and are wandering around and are just trying to cause a problem. Now, as we move on to the carnival locations, there is something very important you need to know. Almost every single one of these attractions has a moment where your players will be able to do something, and because they did that something, it will apply to the adventure later on. A perfect example of that is the Calliope. On the story tracker, jot down the names of the characters who give at least one button to Ernest. If one or more of these characters find themselves trapped or captured in Prismere, they hear the distant whistling of the Calliope and can follow the music to safety. So, it is extremely important that you have these things, and quite frankly, I would be honest about this. I would definitely have the moment in the game where you say, oh, you will remember this later on, or oh, that'll prove useful later. You can have that fun thing. So, what you should do is, in your story tracker, whether you're doing this online or you've got the in-person one, put down the location or event, and put down one for each one of the locations that pertain, and then in the notes there, simply jot down who participated in it. So that way, you know, whenever the session comes, then you can definitely reference it and say, oh, yes, because you did that one thing, that means you get advantage or you can do this other ability that no one else can do. Have those things because that's going to feel really special. I can't tell you how amazing it is to do something and have it be relevant later on because I feel like... A lot of times in these adventures, we keep doing the same things, and yet you typically don't get better at them. You know, <laughs> it seems kind of silly. But it makes sense in this adventure that if you get singing lessons, you're going to be better at singing later on. It makes sense that if you interact with snails, you're going to be better at interacting with snails. It just makes sense, and it's totally great. Now, for the first of the locations located inside of the Witchlight Carnival, we have the Big Top. This is an attraction that anyone can show up to at any time. You do not need to get a ticket punched. And when your players make their way inside, they can see various acts. Once again, there is eight different acts, implying that there is one each hour. But I am going to flush this out some more. I'm going to be having a whole thing in the Discord. So make sure that you stay posted on that. So make sure that if they show up here at any point, they can enjoy some spectacle. Now, there is a dressing room in the back, and if anybody wants to, they can sneak back doing a DC-12 stealth check. And if they make their way inside, they'll see that there's a whole bunch of fancy shenanigans and a whole bunch of costumey stuff, but really not too much going on here. This is definitely something for a bit of the improv, I would imagine. This is definitely something for if your players are getting up to a whole bunch of shenanigans. Maybe they're coming back here to try and steal some uniforms, or maybe they're trying to hide away from someone, or maybe they're trying to blend in with the crowd, whatever it is may be they can definitely find some fun things here. Here in the Bubble Pot Teapot, this is where we get an introduction to your players having to actually spend some of their tickets to actually get into the attraction. And it's here where we meet a whole bunch of cockney goblins that like to say a whole bunch of random slang. And if your players join in on the fun, then it's a great time. Now, the unique part of this is, one, you should definitely emphasize that as your players are walking around, they see people riding around in these bubbles. But the unique thing is, while yes, this could just be a fun little ride, your players can actually use this as a device to get into a whole bunch of various scenarios. Maybe they are trying to sneak past somewhere. Maybe they are trying to get a bird's eye view and try and find a person in particular. Your players can actually use this to great effect. And I say reward them. If they are trying to sneak past and maybe get to where Mr. Witch and Mr. Light are, then allow that to happen. Maybe they're trying to look around for a cattle steam. Allow that to happen etc etc 
Now it's here at the Calliope where your players can hear a whole bunch of music, but more importantly interact with Marigold and Ernst. Ernst is a monkey, but unfortunately he's actually got the mind of a man because he had a body swap with a monkey, but the monkey ran off with his body, so he's kind of stuck. Now, as your players listen in, then they can hear Ernst say, Spare a button if you please, I'll sew it next, all of these. I offer nothing in its place besides a smile upon my face. And this is a great way to once again showcase off that if your players do good things, then they are rewarded. If they do this with no expectation of any reward at all, they simply give a button, then boom, they can get something in return. You mark that on the story tracker, and then if they get captured, then they can be let go, or if something's locked in front of them, it can become unlocked. This thing is a great way to reward those good people. It is at the carousel where if your players get one ticket punch, then they can ride on the carousel. But unfortunately, the carousel is broken. They will meet Diana Cloppington, who is a centaur, but she wasn't always a centaur. And the reason for that is because she made a deal with the hags. And as always, if you make deals with hags, you always got to be careful for what you wish for. She is transformed into the centaur, and now she can't even talk about it or else she has a painful fit. So the thing is, is as your players show up, they will see that the carousel is actually busted. And if they so choose to, they can discover how to fix it using this riddle. And these riddles are actually super great. But unfortunately, these riddles are definitely on the older side. So if you have younger people, they're probably not going to know what it is. Even people my age don't even know what this is. And also importantly is if you're not a native English speaker, you're definitely not going to know what it is. So I do recommend you feel out your group. If you know the kind of group that you're running for, then make riddles that you know that they could solve. Because when I ran this, only a single person only randomly heard one time a stitch in time saves nine. I hadn't heard that in ages, so I totally would not have got it. But if your players are able to get the riddles, whether they be the ones in the book or the ones you make yourselves, that is when they can become privy to some awesome information. And if they solve all these riddles, then they get a free ride. So, hey, maybe they can save themselves that ticket punch. So this information is actually extremely awesome to give out, whether that be you give them the Lost Thing secrets or the Warlock quest secrets. And if you're using some of the quest hooks that I showed off, maybe you can add in where the Lost Siblings are, or maybe you can add in some other fun things about Zybilna. There is a lot of great things you can do with that. Here at the Dragonfly Rides, your players can interact with Northwind, a tree and sapling, and Red, the Awakened Squirrel. But D&D doesn't have a squirrel stat block, so we get a weasel stat block instead, but whatever. Here, we can get a ticket punch to ride on the giant dragonflies. And once again, you should showcase off how a whole bunch of people are riding these things, and it looks totally cool. And as your players ride on one of these things, that is when, boom, there is someone in peril, and if your players are able to help out, then they improve the quality of the Witchlight Carnival, but if they don't help out, then things turn a little dour. Also important here is if your players succeed on navigating their Dragonfly, then mark that on the Story Tracker, because that will help them out later down the line. Now, if your players are inquisitive about what's going on behind the scenes in the Witchlight Carnival, there is, of course, a lot of people not going to say anything, because who are they going to talk to these random strangers, right? But Northwind it will be willing to talk, but Northwind doesn't know that much. But maybe he let some things slip, and with this information, maybe that'll help them out later on. Here at the Feasting Orchard, we get a pie-eating contest. But it's not pie, I guess, it's a cake, but whatever, same thing, right? This is where we get the infamous custard damage, which can totally knock some PCs out, which would be totally hilarious. And if your players enter and win, then they can win themselves a potion of invisibility, which is huge. That could prove so incredibly useful at any point in this adventure. I can't tell you the amount of crazy wacky things your players could potentially get up to if they earn this. Now the real question is, is do you allow for multiple contests and do you allow for your group to just stack up on a whole bunch of potions of invisibility? I would say you'd have to cap it at some point. I would definitely say that you have to draw the line somewhere because if they can just sit here and definitely win all these contests because they are super duper good at it, then that's not going to make any sense. And you can just easily explain away because your characters are getting full and they refuse to eat anymore. Now, here in this section, where we get introduced to Eliwick Tumblestrum, who is actually a character in D&D, who actually crops up quite a lot. 
And Ellie Wick is the one that helped your party out in the first place by giving them some free tickets. This is a great way to help out your players if they ever get stuck. Ellie Wick can just show up and say, hey, gang, uh, maybe you guys should go over there. Maybe uh, you should talk to that person. Because Ellie Wick is just a boisterous individual. And Ellie Wick actually has the excuse of knowing things because of her magical loot. So Eliwick is here just to be sort of a conscious or a guide, I guess, for the player characters. But if they are a bit too naughty, maybe she doesn't interact with them. Here at the Gondola Swans, your players can get a nice, quaint little ride all around the entirety of the Witchlight Carnival, which honestly sounds like a pretty awesome thing, especially if you've been walking around quite a lot and maybe if you've been delving into the custard way too much. Now, if your players hop on the Gondola Ride, then they are going to be met with Featherine, a swan that is actually very haughty. She actually asks a lot of metaphysical questions, and if your players actually entertain her, then she will have definitely seen the awesomeness of the PCs, and will actually tell the PCs a bit of information here. But if the PCs are just like, ugh, whatever, then she's actually going to rock the boat and try to make them fall in the water, which I think is pretty hilarious. I know that can definitely lead to potential you know, antagonism there, but hopefully it's all fun and games. So if your players do actually entertain her, then she can talk about how Candlefoot is having a bit of issues with Palasha, and also talks about Burly, who is actually missing his brother. More on that later on. And also very important is if your players actually impress her, then once again, mark that on the story tracker because that'll show that they have great debating skills. Also, interacting with Featherine in either one way or the other is going to either improve or decrease the happiness in the Witchlight Carnival. Here at the Hall of Illusions, this is going to be the classic mirror maze thing. But something really cool is, located just outside of the Hall of Illusions, there is one of those classic little booths of a individual but instead of it being someone that is doing tarot cards this is actually a figurine of tasha and it is a machine of tasha's hideous laughter now the really sad part of this is as your players walk up they see that there is two halflings and one is about to propose to the other but the one getting proposed to accidentally gets caught up in the tasha's hideous laughter and begins laughing at which point, the person runs off and runs into the Hall of Illusions, and things are really sad. Now, Reuben Sugarwood, the halfling that ran off into the Hall of Illusions, is super sad, and if your players do not help Reuben, he may be in for quite a terrible time. Entering this place costs one ticket punch, and also interesting is this is the location of the transfer over to the land of Prismere, but until they know that information, they're not going to know, right? <laughs> now, the Witchlight Hand operating this one in particular is named Candlefire. Foot the mime but the thing is candlefoot wasn't always a mime candlefoot used to always be a happy clown but unfortunately his voice was stolen so this is definitely a unique interaction you can have if you're doing it in person or if you have a video you can definitely try to be miming some things out but if you're just doing it over voice you just have to say oh yeah he mimes this he mimes that now the sad story with candlefoot here is that he was about to propose to palasha the mermaid entertainer and as he did so, his voice was stolen by Kettle Steam, and now he's all sad and dour. So if you were able to hook the two back up together, then your players can get a very valuable lesson. But maybe that'll be done later on. Now inside this Hall of Illusions, make sure you play up the weird factor. And as they look around, they see reflections of them being skinny and fat, tall and short, old and young. Just have all these things play out. And if they are specifically chasing after Reuben, then they're going to have to make some perception checks. Now, this is pretty scary because if your players do not succeed in finding Reuben in time, then he is sucked into Prismere by Soapig. Now, if Reuben is taken into the mirror and specifically Prismere in three whole minutes, meaning that it is extremely likely that if they literally just charge right on in trying to find him, that they're going to find him. Because if you've got a whole party and they each get to roll three times, it's more than likely you're going to get someone that rolls high. So if you want, you could try to make it a little bit harder by making it a group check, or maybe you increase the difficulty a little bit there, whatever the case may be. If your players do not get to him in time, he is sucked in, and that'll prove pretty eventful later on because... If they show up to Prismere later on, they may have to guard Reuben because he is just a commoner. 
Now, it's important that as your player has passed by that Tasha's hideous laughter machine, if anybody succeeds on the history check and discovers that Tasha has an alternative name of Igwil, then jot that down because that'll prove very useful later on in the adventure. And if the Reuben is taken by Sopig, the characters might encounter him later on. If your players succeed in saving Reuben, then yay! The proposal's on, and you can have a cute, beautiful little moment there, and the mood raises up. And if they fail to get him in time, then boom, of course, he is gone, and the morale is shot. Here at Lost Property, your players will come face to face with a Displacer Beast. But, thankfully, she's harmless. Or at least, she's not harming anybody right now. Durlogren, the Displacer Beast, is simply staying here, looking after some individuals. But, there is something clearly amiss with Durlogren. And, as your players walk up, then one of the kids that she's looking after runs away because she bears a bit of her fangs. And, there is now a missing child. Now, if your players are so willing, they can spend a bit of time trying to find the child and bring him back to the lost property. And if they do so, then the place is going to get a little bit better. But if they don't find him in an hour, then things are going to get a little bit worse. The important thing here is if your players do this request, then Durlogren is actually going to say, Hey, my kid is actually missing. And if you find him, that would be tremendous. So in addition to getting this quest on saving Durlogren's cub, she will also mention, hey, if you're going to do anything, then I would not confront Mr. Witch and Mr. Light. I'd sneak in and eavesdrop on them. Here at the Mystery Mine, we get a blast from the past as your players are going to go right riding into a dragon's maw. This is definitely a reference to the 80s D&D cartoon, which is totally awesome. I'm down for it. And your players can come here to conquer their fears. Now to get your ticket punched, your players will interact with Zafixo, the mage, who will say, hey... Tell me your greatest fears as you look into the all-seeing eye. This is actually really fun. You can have each of the players write down what their character's greatest fears are. And you can totally use that for a later time because that's going to be totally great. And you have them ride the ride. And as they ride the ride, then boom, they make those wisdom saving throws. So here's the thing. If they succeed, then it's totally awesome. They have conquered their fear. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> if they fail... And it's been noted, and I'm sure if you skim through it, it might have seemed a little crazy here. Any character who fails three or more of the ride saving throws is haunted by nightmares for 1d8 days until the nightmares end. The character must succeed DC 12 wisdom saving throws or gain 1d3 levels of exhaustion. So, there is technically a chance that if your players ride this ride and they just roll really, really bad constantly, they're going to die. It is incredibly unlikely because given how many times you have the chance to roll, you're more than likely going to succeed. But if you do want that hardcore element and you do want the rules as written element of it, then keep it as is because it's not very likely PCs die. And more importantly, if a PC does die, that will be totally hilarious and you can tell us all about it. Now, the really powerful thing here is not just the fact that your pieces could die, but also if a character succeeds on all the saving throws, they are gain advantage on all charisma-based ability checks at the carnival. Meaning if they come here first, they theoretically have advantage on all the persuasion, intimidations, and whatever else around here. And that's actually really powerful. Down here at the Pixie Kingdom, your players will think that they are larger than life. And if they so choose, they can get a ticket punched. And boom, they can be made into tiny people. And a really cute thing here is if your players adopt these little names and they actually stick with their names during their time in the Pixie Kingdom, then the Witchlight Carnival's mood will improve by one, which is pretty cool. And to be fair, if you get called Jellybean Starfish and you don't stick with that name, then you're a scumbag. Now, as your players explore around this Pixie Kingdom, now transformed into tiny little creatures, they can interact with all the things going on here, and it's totally cool, right? They can see that there's a talkative hamster named Biscuit who's awakened. So, something to note is, <laughs> this happened in my game. My players showed up here as kids, and then they showed up here eight years later. Unfortunately, <laughs> hamsters don't live that long, so <laughs> I had to come up with a new name real quick. So, if you have Biscuit originally as their kids, and then they show up here years later, maybe it is now, I don't know, Cookie or Trinket or something right there. But whatever the name of this talkative hamster is, your players can learn some valuable information here in regards of the Kanku Troublemaker and Candlefoot the Mime and Burly the Bugbear. Your players can learn all these things and hey, that just adds more to the flavor. 
Now the fun activity your players can do here is playing hide and seek. If your players play hide and seek, then you can have them scatter all over and you can have them describe where they're going, what they're doing. You can have them make a whole bunch of stealth checks. And whoever is the last person standing, they earn themselves some pixie dust. Pretty cool. They can definitely use that later on. And it's just a fun time. And your players, as they explore around the kingdom, they can go to Biscuit's Wheel or whatever the answer's name is. Flower Bed, Heron's Nest. And if your players are trying to do their utmost to hide, they must make a DC 12 persuasion check in order to get everyone to hush there. And this will grant them advantage on the stealth check. Pretty fun. Up here at Silversong Lake, your players can enjoy a free performance by Palasha the Mermaid. Now, as your players are trying to enjoy themselves a performance by Palasha, that is when Kettle Steam is going to come up and try and ruin the show. This is a fun little thing here, because if she is able to successfully disrupt this performance, then the tracking mood is going to go down, and if anybody is able to identify Kettle Steam, they can try and chase after her. This leads into catching Kettle Steam, and we'll be covering all of that once we get to those special events. So the real sad part about all this is if Palasha is booed off, then she will go crying and swimming down the river, and she's going to take refuge by the Hall of Illusions, right next to where her almost betrothed is. So she's going to stay there for a long time, and then she's not going to leave until an act of gallantry is performed, such as helping Candlefoot with his lost voice. But that does imply that your players could do potentially other things to try and help her out of that whole mess. But, of course, getting Candlefoot back on his feet is a great way to go. Now, I'm trying to think of things your players could do, but quite frankly, she's kind of a stranger. Unless your players have the witch light hand back around, then she may not be a stranger. But, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what they could possibly do to try and help out this situation. But, if your players do something absolutely creative to get her back on her feet, or I guess on her tail, then run with it. That's totally awesome. Now, what's really cool is if your players are successful in helping her out, then the mood is going to actually raise by two, which is a pretty big deal. And also, if your players are able to get her out of the rut, then she will give your player singing lessons and mark that down because those singing lessons will prove useful later on. Now, located all around this place, there's a whole bunch of small stalls and they are offering up a whole bunch of delectable goods. And it is important that you remind your players that, hey, your characters are getting hungry because if they come here and they're here for hours and hours on end walking around, they're naturally going to get hungry. So they are probably going to have to use a couple of their tickets to get themselves some food. And most important of all here is there is a fun cast of games. We've got the ring toss, the tail, the gnome poetry contest, all these fun things. And also very importantly is a whole bunch of cool prizes. These prizes are actually really cool because we get some Feywild trinkets, which are pretty fun. But we also get several of these one-time use magic spells, which is really cool. You know, if your players get themselves a spider climb for a little bit, that's awesome. If the players get themselves a minor illusion cantrip, that's awesome. These things are actually really cool, and hopefully this incentivizes them to join in on all these fun games. My most favorite of these was the goblin wrestling, because if your players show up as kids, and as kids they wrestle a goblin one-on-one, -on -one, and then they show up later on, and now they're much older, then they wrestle two goblins at once, you know, that's kind of cool. Now it's here at Snail Racing where your players can get themselves into high-octane, crazy, awesome racing as they punch their ticket and they can get themselves invested in these races. And what's really cool here is no check required, no nothing. If your players just uh, simply show up here, then absolutely mark them down for the story tracker because that could prove useful later on. Now what's interesting here is if at least half of the characters participate in the race, then boom, the carnival raises in its mood. But if anybody tries to cheat, anyone tries to break the rules, then boom, the mood lowers. Now we get a whole awesome crew and list here of the different ones. I pretty sure flower flash has got to be the one to beat each of these snails needs a jockey so if you don't have eight player characters which i hope you don't because eight's oh my gosh i don't want to deal for it you have the rest be filled out by a whole bunch of commoners and then you get the races going now the races are pretty simple to track there i would suggest having some sort of grid that is a visual reminder for everybody about how far all these snails are moving and you can have all those numbers just shooting up like a graph and it'll just be this high octane thing you can have gas 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 in the background you can have that fun time 
Now to add more fun to the crazy chaotic mess that is the snail race, we get a whole bunch of surprises, and I say just roll on it every single round, and then boom, something fun's going to happen, and just keep on rolling randomly to see who gets hit and who doesn't. And at the end, hopefully one of the player characters win, and then they get a potion of advantage, which is actually a pretty cool prize. What is nice is if you come in dead last, then hey, at least you don't walk away with nothing. You do in fact get a cute little wand that is able to cast Dancing Lights once, and once it does so, your wand turns into a tulip. And last for locations in the Witchlight Carnival, we have the Staff Area. The only way your players are going to get into here is if they are escorted here, or if they sneak in here. And mind you, there is a lot of ways to sneak in here more than just trying to hop over. Like I said before, maybe you use the balloons, maybe you use the dragonflies. Maybe there's a lot of different ways you approach this situation. That being said, though, trying to get in here could prove deadly <laughs> if anybody tries to scale that wall. They could potentially take all that piercing damage, and that's really bad. I would strongly suggest that if anybody tries to try and mount this thing, you tell them, hey, there is thorns here, and these look like they're going to hurt. And if that doesn't dissuade them, then hopefully that 1d8 doesn't knock them out. And if it does, then hey, <laughs> they had it coming. And in here, your players can get themselves introduced to Burly and Thacko. Thacko just, oh, <laughs> so classic. Thank God we're not using that system anymore. Uh, your players will interact with these if they so choose, but if they're trying to sneak in here, maybe they're trying to avoid these ones. But most important of all is if they come here and they're trying to overhear what's going on, they could potentially overhear a conversation between Mr. Witch and Mr. Light, which can give them some insight about what's going on here. And if they stay around to hear a bit more, then you could potentially try and flavor it up some more. Maybe you add in some more text and lines there. So this is definitely a great way to have some fun espionage, I guess, in here. Now, if your players show up here and are looking to steal things and they show up at the right time when both Mr. Witch and Mr. Light are gone, then they could potentially get their hands on some pretty powerful items here. They could get the crown of the Witchlight Monarch, they could get themselves a potion of diminution, potion of growth, potion of advantage, and a whole bunch of gold and silver. Though, honestly, gold and silver is completely worthless in the venture, but whatever. <laughs> also interesting is the potions are not labeled, so if you have some whatever identifying rules on potions, then then's the time to use them. So if your players do show up here and they steal the Witchlight Monarch crown, that is definitely one of the ways your players can get themselves to Prismere by holding that crown hostage. That's going to do it for us for the locations in the Witchlight Carnival, but next time we will be going over all of the various events, and I'll be talking about a whole bunch of things you can do to spice up this location, as well as some possibilities on what your players may be doing here. So go ahead and tell me, what are your favorite attractions from this location? Do you like the rides? Do you like the stall booths? What do you like from here? Do you like the little sub quests that are going on here? Or do you just want to get your players right into the action? Go ahead and tell me those things because I would love to hear it. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you for watching. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my amazing patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.